Well, good evening, everybody. Um, for those that you don't know, know me, uh, my name is Sant, Sant Cervantes, and um, we're just going to have a little chat about cross country. I'd like to make it sort of informal, and if people have got questions, I think actually we'll, we'll do it as we're going along because the intention of this talk uh, is that I wanted to make it immediate because um, the weather forecast actually looked quite reasonable last week. I mean, it's transpired that it's not been as good as uh, what we hoped, but basically we've had a run of westerlies and today a run of northerlies that basically, if we get time, I can show you the satellite photographs, but effectively we've had wave every day this week. Um, however, um, Port Moat's only been able to use one of those days, uh, Aboyne's used one, um, and obviously we used another day today, and that's for a variety of reasons that hopefully, if we get enough time, I'll, I'll try and explain why. Um, but the idea, you know, is, is, is to sort of start getting people thinking about cross countries. I mean, today, all the people that were flying were, were relatively experienced. And I mean, there's, what really got me thinking about it was that I was talking to uh, Andrew Powers uh, last week um, and he got his silver height and uh, I don't think he's even 16 yet and uh, he got up to almost 7,000 feet and he was completely chuffed uh, and I can't help but remember you know I mean I didn't go solo that early I went solo you know at, uh, at 16 um, and here we have these young guys already, you know, got their silver height. Um, you know, it's, it's terrific. And, and I can remember my early days in, in gliding when I basically just bumbled along and sort of did my own thing. And I really didn't think about cross countries per se. Uh, I mean, my silver distance, I sort of basically drifted off downwind and did it. I didn't really think about it. Whereas now, you know, I'm obviously at a, a, a reasonably competent level. Uh, and now, I mean, Kate calls me a professional glider pilot. But really, if one really wants to go cross country, one has to think of it in a logical way. And it, and it usually involves, you know, a, a bit of work and, and, and a bit of planning, actually. But when we first start off, it, it's a bit ad hoc. Like if you take, if you take Andrew, I mean, he got to 7,000 feet. Well, that, that's two kilometers. And so he can glide still air 60 kilometers. So if he had wanted to and gone downwind, he could have done his silver distance at the same time. And it's a matter of having the uh, right mindset. And so what I want to do is just go through some of the building blocks of what we need to know about going cross country. Now this particular picture uh, of, of Port Moak uh, was taken last Wednesday and it wasn't a, a particularly good day and there was a lot of cloud about and I was actually a wee bit concerned uh, because it did start to cloud over and it's typical warm sector uh, conditions. Now what I mean by warm sector is, is that if you have a depression you have this peak uh, and you have a, a warm front followed by uh, a cold front and it sort of joins together at the top of the depression and the bit in between the two is called the warm sector and when you get to the top of the peak when you get into the top bit you usually get quite a bit of cloud and, and that shows you a bit of a problem as I say as we go along if there's any questions just just uh, if you want to sort of uh, you know uh, interrupt me Kate because obviously I'll be chatting and I won't be able to see uh, you know, uh, on, on the chat thing. Right. Oh dear, why is this not working? Let me just try this. Okay. Now I want to start off with, with the types of weather that we get or the types of air mass that we get. Because if we look up at the, um, oops, oh no. if we look up at the uh, top left, we got post your own, well, let's just start again. What we've got is the polar front and the polar front moves up and down, moves down, it moves, uh, it moves up in the summer and moves down in the winter. So in the winter we're 
usually influenced by cold uh, uh, air masses, either polar oceanic, which is cold and wet, or polar continental, which is cold and dry. And that's very good for thermals in the spring. Last week, we were affected by temperate oceanic. And I'll, I'll, I'll have a little diagram where we where I point that out. And, and temperate oceanic is, is warm and wet, whereas temperate continental coming in off the continent is uh, dry and uh, hot. Uh, and basically, we're influenced by these by these four types of uh, air mass. And the next picture will sort of show it. If we look at last Wednesday, what we can see is that the air is coming up from the southwest, and it's bringing all this warm, moist air, and it's hitting the UK, and particularly on the west coast, it's quite cloudy. And as I explained later. It then breaks up and clears as we're going along. Now, one of the points, if you ever want to get an idea of where the jet stream is, is basically if you look at the peak, see here's a warm sector if you see my point. If you look at the peak there, that's where the center of the jet stream will be. Uh, I, I found that out a few weeks ago. So here we've got, as I say, temperate oceanic. Up here we've got polar. Up in the north, up, in, up top left, we've got post oceanic. We can see we've got a high pressure there, and we've got uh, polar continental, and obviously the um, um, uh, temperate continental, where we get air come up from the Sahara occasionally. And the jet stream, as I say, is the dividing line between the polar air masses and the temperate air masses. And that's what it was like on Wednesday uh, when uh, Alistair and myself flew. Now, this is uh, the jet stream for today, right? And what we have there, as you can see, the jet stream is actually got a northerly flow. And as I said, you know, when we looked at that chart previously, the little peak was just about there. So it's about right. And what we call this is, is an omega curve. And if you get an omega curve, then that's really good for waves. So when we see a jet and it's curving round like that, and we're on, on uh, well, if we go northerly or northwesterly, that's ideal for us. That, that's, that's really nice. Um, there were other factors affecting us today in that the air was a bit unstable. Um, and a bit damp as uh, it later on started showering today. So when I say you've got these four air masses, they do tend to sometimes mix a bit, which is where the problems then occur. Right, so there we have it. And as we can see, what's happened is the highs moved up here, um, but it's, it's, it's getting a lot of influence from the polar um, from the polar maritime air to a degree. Um, and basically the polar front, or should I say the jet stream as I say, was following that part. Okay. So those are the sort of things that I, I look at initially. Now these are just taken from the Met Office and the jet streams taken off uh, NetWeather and they're all free. Right, that was it on Wednesday. Okay, and as we can see, not so much of an omega curve, but uh, um, that was not bad really. It, it was uh, we're in the warm side of the uh, of the of the uh, polar front, and I mean yesterday the temperature was sixteen degree. Not yesterday on Friday the temperature was sixteen degrees because we've got this warm air coming up from uh, uh, from the uh, uh, from the Azores and so on. Now, I keep talking about the phone effect, all right? And before I just go on about it, I'll just go to a picture where you can see it. Let me just go forward. Let me just go forward. Here we have an example of the phone effect. We've got more cloud up here 
and it's drying out in the lee of the grampians, all right? The air is definitely drier in this area here, and that's a foam gap, and we'll come to that. So we just go back, all right? So what basically happens, I mean, this is being recorded, so I'm not gonna go into actual figures, but in essence, right, dry air cools at three degrees per thousand feet, all right? And as it cools, because it's getting cooler, it can't hold as much water moisture until eventually it gets to a point which is called the saturation point where cloud starts to form. And so what tends to happen is cloud forms and then the temperature drops at 1.5 degrees per thousand feet. Because as the water is being released, it releases the energy that made it water vapor initially. So that's called latent heat. So basically what happens is the air goes up over a mountain range or a hill and it reaches its saturation point and it starts to precipitate out. And then it goes over the top of the mountain and starts to come down. But because it hasn't got so much water because it's been precipitated out, there comes a point on the downward slope where rather than it, it uh, uh, warming at 1.5 degrees, because it's got less water, the cloud will disappear at a higher level than when it started because there's less water in it. And so then the temperature starts to increase as we're going down. And we end up with it being warmer on the east, on, on the lee side of a mountain. And that's called either a phone effect or a phone gap. And when we look at wave, effectively what we, we've got, we've got phone effect in terms of mountain ranges, but we've got phone gaps in terms of, of wave. Is there any questions on that one at all? Because it's really important that, for, because that's how we can see wave, if you see my point. Anybody on the chat there, Kate? Okay, that's so we're questions. all right. So basically what happens, as I say, just to reiterate, is the air precipitates or it rains on the upslope and then warms up. So we end up with this warm air in the lee and in the lee of the mountains. And it can be just a few degrees or it can be quite a bit. I mean, they have the winds in America, the Chinook, um, uh, what's the one in uh, the Minstral in, uh, uh, in the Rhone Valley and so on. So, Effectively, when we look at a wave, if we're going, wind's blowing from left to right, we've got a wave pattern. So let's just go through it. What we can end up with, and it happens a lot in, the, uh, in, in Scotland, is that we end up with a phone cap cloud. And there's a thing in, in the atmosphere that we call the boundary layer. Now, what the boundary layer is, is basically, uh, it depends on the day, uh, and it depends also on wind strength as well. Um, but basically, uh, the boundary layer is where above that height, the air is not affected by thermals. I'm not talking about thunderstorms and things like that. But it's not affected by thermals, ground turbulence that's called by mountains or, or, or slopes or whatever. And so, we get to a certain level where the mountains are not affecting the flow of the air. And above that boundary layer, the, the air is for all intents and purposes, all intents and purposes, laminar. And so we've got a lovely smooth flow over it. So what we've got is below the boundary layer, we have thermals and ridge lift and all that associated turbulence above it, nice smooth air. Now, G. Dale has got this video uh, on wave soaring from Onamarama 
and I really, really recommend you looking at it. It's brilliant because uh, he describes uh, what wave is, and basically, it's it's their gravity wave, and that sounds really poncy and uh, you know a bit technical. But the way that G explains it, he explains it very well, and I'm using a bit of of, of what he described. So. What happens, just to carry on, is that we got, here we've got, say, the Grampians, for example, and what you end up with is a phone cap cloud on it, and the air that comes along, the air goes down, is, starts to go down over the mountain, and it then, under certain conditions, can create wave, and off we go and we get wave. Now, on this boundary layer, what you'll get, I haven't drawn it very well, is little shear lines and you'll get turbulence and so on. As the flow is going, is transitioning from turbulent boundary layer air into smooth laminar flow air. And you'll get a transition point and so on. And you can feel it when you're on the ridge and you're going into wave. You climb up, you move forward, and you get this cobblestones effect, and that's the shear line, and then you move into the wave, and that's where the wave is in phase with the ridge. But you can also get it where the air is going down, and that's not going to help thermals, but then it's going up, and that will assist thermals. And you can get, on certain days, wave with thermals underneath it. Now you can get a mixture of the two, and we get these things called rotor, rotor clouds, which you can see them, these circular rotating clouds, and what they are is the, again a manifestation of this shear line. And so what we do is we thermal in this turbulent area, and all you've got to do is just stay in it. It's not like thermaling, it's literally like climbing up a wall using your fingertips. And every now and again, you have to move forward because the air is blowing you back, but the wave is staying constant, right? Because if we look, or well, staying constant in relation to the ground, because if we look up here where the wave is actually starting, you can see the lenticular, what is happening is, is as we go up, the air is cooling and you get a cloud forming and then it goes round and down. And so the leading edge is constantly forming and the trailing edge is constantly dissipating. So the wave appears to be stationary. But when you're underneath it, what happens is when you're getting in the shear line or, or trying to get up into the wave, is what you do is you circle and then you have to go forward and basically keep doing this until you make the transition into the laminar flow. Is there any questions on that? It's a brief description of it. There's just a comment in the chat, Sant, to say that unfortunately that video link uh, apparently isn't available anymore, which is a... Well, I just looked at it yesterday. Ah, right. Well, there may be something wrong with your video link then. I'm just Googling G-Dale wave. Put G-Dale um, onorama. Yeah, okay. I found I, I, I went G-Dale wave into, the, into YouTube and it's the top link, I think, wave flying lecture. So yes. it's there, but I think there may be something wrong with your, I'll, I'll post the link I get. Yeah, because it, it is excellent. And I've actually got it. Um, and uh, I can I can show you, I can, I can put it on at the end, actually, if you remind me, because I think I've still got it on. I've been working on this <laughs> since I got back from flying. Uh, right, I, I've just posted what I think is the correct link. Okay, no, that's lovely. It's excellent, absolutely excellent. Now, you know, that's a beast description and, and G. Dale puts it much better. Now, it is possible we're talking about G. Dale, um, but he's coming up to Port Moke in the spring. Um, it depends on what he's doing, but uh, I've asked him if he was available and uh, we've got him penciled in for March, but he has been selected for the world team next year. And um, I'll ring him up in the next few days just to confirm it. Uh, because he is a busy man, but it's tentatively booked for March. 
So, and he'll be able to talk to us and give us his advice in, in person. He'll be up for a few days. Yeah, it's really oh, weird because so my link looks identical to the link that John said was wrong, but it works for me anyway. Good. So try excellent. it, people. That's excellent. Good. Right. So, yeah, let's just finish. So we covered that. Now, so we've spoken about the phone effect where behind a mountain range, it's dry. And we just have to look at places like Aberdeen. Uh, and that's a lot drier. Uh, I, I used to live in Aberdeen. And when I moved down here, I, or when I moved to Port Moak, I was horrified. And actually, there's some pictures that I took, which unfortunately is not part of the lecture, um, or the talk, should I say, uh, showing the field on, on Thursday uh, uh, and Friday when, when people couldn't, well, on Friday, that's right, because uh, Roy did a 300 from a Boyan, and, and we were affected by what's known as the fourth Clyde Valley effect, where the air is channeled, is channeled up the fourth Clyde uh, valleys. Uh, and so we end up with all this crap as what we had. Whereas a Boyan, because it's in the lee of the mountains, was nice and clear. And that's one of the problems with Port Moak in Westerlies, we do really get affected by the fourth Clyde uh, Valley effect. So we discussed the phone, um, the phone uh, uh, effect, and we can see it on this picture here. Now this is taken from, I use three sources uh, for my information, because basically, I'm not being funny about it, if you've planned a flight correctly, that's 75% of the flight. You just have to go and execute it. Now, today has proved us wrong because we didn't, because it wasn't quite as good as we thought. But another of my mottos is that basically only 25% of my flights work. And I think that's a pretty good average, actually. And so we have to accept that as glider pilots. Now, looking at this map, you can see but what we have, because you can look at it, it's, it's an unstable air mass, right, which is not supposedly good for wave, and it's producing cloud streaks, and you can see them. But as we can see, it's starting off at the top there, and then it's drying out down here, right? And this is taken from, um, uh, from RASP, and I use it. Uh, but it, it is a blunt instrument, uh, whereas I tend to use um top meteo and this was for forecast for yesterday and that's more like it and what you've got is the scales here and basically a lot of cloud at 500 feet fog but i mean obviously the mountains here at 3,000 feet two and a half thousand feet so they're just touching it and the photographs will show that later on okay uh, and i use that a lot and i also use uh sky sight and again, so we've got 20% around here, clear here, and then increasing. So I take an interpretation of all three uh, as, as I'm doing things. And that was for today, right? So what did the actual pictures show? Let's have a look. So here we are. This is uh, taken from NASA, the NASA sat pick. And there we have an example of a phone and a phone gap. And you can see the phone gaps because here's the wave. And this is a real phone effect here, right? And then got some wave here as well. But big blotchy areas. Now, I think that was up until about 12 o'clock today because if we look at the next one, this is this is a terror sat photograph. And if you look at the cloud shadows, it looks about 11 o'clock, which is about right. But you can tell the time from a cloud shadow. Whereas this is aqua, right? And I think that's a lot later. And it did get a lot later. It did get a lot cloudier later on, if we remember. And we actually had a few spots of rain and so on. That's later. But we still got the phone effect. All right, and there's still the wave there. The big blotches of cloud and all the rest of it, which is what stymied us today. 
Any more questions up to now, Kate? No, there's been a bit of argy-bargy about the link, but I think we're all clear on that now. Okay. Now, I've put this picture in because this is for the early solo cross-country pilots. I mean, I have got the chat on the BGA uh, webinars, and it's taken from there. But the point I wish to make about this, this is taken as a northwesterly, right? But you just have to tilt it round, and you can work it out for yourself. Uh, but the point I wish to make is that for early solo wave cross countries, basically in the lee of the Grampians, we've got a really good landing area. Obviously, as one gets more experience, one starts going into the mountains a wee bit more. And that's all explained in, in, in my earlier lectures. But the point that I wish to make is, is that you can actually go uh, places and, and really have a lot of land out options all the way up to um, Fort Doom and pretty well down to uh, Loch Lomond, staying in the lee of it, the Grampians. And in northwesterlies and northerlies, um, you know, you've really got a lot of options. I mean, what tends to happen is people get into the wave and then go, well, where do I go now? Well, why not just have a bumble around and find out? You see my point. And then gradually extend your boundaries. Right. Okay, so, so coming back to the chart, right? Um, the wind actually was about, in the east, was more easterly, it was about 0, 0.20, 0, and in the west it was northerly. Um, and so, any if it goes slightly east, uh, it, it, it starts to produce problems. But I mean, basically, one, if you stay in the centre of the country, then you're going to be, or in the centre of the Grampian region, south of the uh, escarpment, then that's basically the area uh, that is going to produce the, the best way. Right, so I was, I'm now going into the planning stage, right, because I planned my flight last night and I used that previous chart to get a general picture. I then had a look at the cloud cover which we discussed. And I like SkySight because it's also got the turn points on it, which is really useful to make my decisions, right? And so this is the task I set, which was going from Creef up to just north of Oban and then to Brecon, back to uh, Charlie Bravo Golf and then back at Creef. Now, let me just move, I've got a little thing on top of this, let me just move this. So this was at nine o'clock. This was, this was generated um, yesterday. Sorry, yeah, that was generated yesterday. Well, it's actually the 19th. Um, and it's for nine o'clock this morning. And so what I was wanting to use was this bit here. See what I've done here, this is SkySight, put on top of CU, which is a great tool. You've got two choices. You can put top meteo for thermals, or you can put sky site for either thermals and wave. And I find it really useful. Now, because I've been working on this since I got back, unfortunately I lost my 1500 charts, but I've got the nine and 1500 chart, uh, the nine and 1200 chart. Uh, Sam, can I interrupt you for half a tick? Because there's a question. Um, somebody is asking, did you aerato to Creef? Um, oh, absolutely. And what release height? 5,000 feet. That cost me 54 quid. Now, I was on the ridge at the end, and I saw people at four, 5,000 feet. I mean, coming back to, um, coming back to, again, good question, because this is where the planning comes in. Alistair chose Perth. I didn't particularly think that was a good choice because when I looked at the chart, 
I thought Crieff would be better because it's surrounded more by mountains. So if you look there, there's a bit of wave in the lee of what you've got is Crieff there, you've got methylene there, but Alistair chose Perth, he can just he can talk about it later. Um, but I don't think Perth was a good spot, so I chose Crieff and it was great. You know, I think, I think uh, you know, I was getting up to 10,000 feet there. Now coming back to it, there's three ways of getting into wave. There's ridge lift, there's thermaling, rotoring into it, which we've already spoken about, and there's aero towing into it. And me, I can't be asked. Now I will. I spent two hours trying to get back on into the wave at, uh, 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 when I came back, but I couldn't. And basically, you've got to tow to where the lift is. And I know that usually there's lift up either mefflin or in today's case, creep. And so I tow. And basically, if you tow 500 foot above cloud base and it's waving, you know, Bob's your uncle. Now, what I did was Tony gave me a tow to 5,000 feet and I dived across and I got into the wave at creep at about three and a half thousand feet. And then I just tested my engine. So I didn't have to use it, right? But with my level of experience, I knew, and I could see it as well once I was getting there, that it was working. Uh, and so to me, aero toes the thing. Using the ridge, it usually takes two hours to get into wave. I mean, on Wednesday, uh, I took off, and I got into, I took a winch launch, got onto the ridge, into the wave. And I was actually in the wave. And then I forgot, I, I realized I'd forgotten to switch the on, oxygen on. So I had to come down and land to switch the oxygen on. And so I took another winch launch, got into, onto the ridge lift, could see the wave. And I thought, I can't be asked. And so I started the turbo and got into it because I'm not wasting time to try and get around my task because it's all very challenging and all this sort of stuff. But for me, I need this need for speed, right? And wave flying to me is all about flying fast. And, and I can't, you know, get in the bloody stuff and start using it rather than the niceties of uh, scratching your way into it. I mean, if I do, if I need to, then I will, but you know, like off a winch. Anyway, little ramble there. So, I chose this route because, and Alice's in certain ways was similar. And, uh, you know, go to Oban, and then I could go along like that if I needed to, to get to Brecon, to just dive across there. And if we look at the uh, 12 o'clock one, hang on, oh, it's stuck. The 12 o'clock one, you can see that's beautifully lined up now going from Crease to uh, there, and it's not too bad. So, you know, I run the whole sequence, if you see my point, and I pick the optimum time, which is 12 o'clock, because if I'm, take, if I'm in the wave by nine and, and 12 o'clock, that's midpoint on the flight, three o'clock I should be landing or completing the task, if you see my point. Now, I've lost the 1500 foot, 1500 one, but that showed it weakening again. But you can see what I do is I run the sequence, which is why CU and SkySight is so good. Sorry, why CU and SkySight is so good is, is because I can plan. And that's hard. And then you've got a mental picture when you're looking at the confusing clouds and you sort of try and interpret what the maps, forecast maps are saying, what you're actually seeing. Now these were the, uh, again, the midpoint, and this was taken from uh, RASP, and as you can see, but you can see that's the actual forecast this morning, because it's 12 hours, right, up here. So it's valid 12 GMT today, but the forecast was, was done 12 hours ago, whereas this one, you can see, was 36 hours ago. And it's actually not a lot of difference. The only difference is that the wind speed 
this is that's the forecast yesterday and it's 45 knots 35 here 45 there whereas uh, come on whereas today it's actually the wind speed is uh, 35 knots the wind was supposedly weaker it wasn't actually it was about 40 45 47 knots but today was meant to be slightly weaker than forecast yesterday but that looks pretty good when you look at it. Okay, so that was uh, 12 o'clock. And this is again using SkySight, and that's again taken at 12 o'clock. So the, the planning is trying to utilize, I can't see what's difficult about it. What you do is you <laughs> pick a wave bar and you fly along it. I can't see, it. that's not rocket science. Uh, yeah, now, that is, let's just have a look because it's this is the forecast this morning and it's actually weaker because if we look here, this was the best bit here near Blair Athol uh, and it wasn't, <laughs> there was nothing there actually. So we can see that's what it was like today and that was yesterday's forecast, but you've got to go on your forecast. But I did have a quick look this morning at five o'clock when I got up. And I could see that it was weaker before I set off to come to the driving club. Right, so this is at 1500 and you can see it's, it's weaker, which is what actually happened. And yeah, so that's what it was actually forecast today. And that's what it was like yesterday. So there is differences and it's always best to get the most up-to-date information but when you're taking off at eight o'clock in the morning you know it's, has, it's really quite rushed you know having a look at, uh, at the weather forecast it was basically pretty similar so i've described quite a bit of the planning it's actually the planning and thinking about the route that's really the uh, I, I think 75 percent of the time 75 percent of, of what we now we come to the actual flights and this was Alistair's flight. Now I've taken this from the BGA ladder. And if you go on to Glana and you can put a satellite picture on it and, uh, and that's what he did. And basically he got to um, Oban, but he couldn't get back. And so you have to start the engine. Um, and as we can see, you can see the wave edges. And you can see here is a bit of cloud and I couldn't cross that cloud. I just couldn't get over it, which stymied my efforts. And these are the pictures that Alistair took, which again, that's approaching Oban. So it's really quite clear that to the north, you had this cloud and that's actually the airfield is just there. So you've got your alternate if all goes pear shaped. Are you on, Alistair? Let's have a look. Is he there? Let's have a look. Has he signed himself off? No, I'm here. Go on, Alistair. Give us a brief description. Yeah, it was it was it was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was uh, I, 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 after I took off for the second time, when I remembered to actually make the declaration to the logger, which is always a good thing to remember to do part of the preparation before you take off, and not remembering after you've taken off. Um, but I made a decision to start from Perth because I, I was thinking, well, the bar along past uh, Methven to Creef will work and get me up. So start at 5,000 feet Perth and then run along that bar and get to Creef at 8, 10,000 feet, which is great. Didn't quite work out like that because left Perth, end up time I got to Meth and to under two thousand feet, and then scramble back up to get into the wave. Uh, and then once I got back into the wave, I thought, well, that's a bit slow. I'll go back and start again. So I went back to Perth, back to about four thousand feet, started the second time, and this time I went past Meth at twelve hundred feet, thinking <laughs> that's really not very good, and managed to scramble back up into the wave from twelve hundred feet and then uh, continued across 
but it was good going past Creef. Uh, as Sant says, Creef's almost always a, a hot spot. Good lift there, and a good bar running away around um, up Loch Erm and across that way, uh, across top of Loch, uh, Loch Loman. And then I was climbing all the time, knowing that there was cloud ahead. So um, uh, by the time I got to the cloud bank, I was at 10,000 feet and able to just tiptoe over the top of it, around the back of Kurukan and into Oban. But at Oban, there was there was no wave bars. You can see here, there's just there was just nothing. And there was nothing obviously working. So I went around the turn point, ran back to the clouds that looked like they should work and none of them worked. So I uh, uh, spent, spent a, a happy 20 minutes ridge soaring up towards um, uh, Tulla Loch. And at that point, I thought at uh, 1,200 feet over a field, I thought, no, it's, this is not sensible. I'll start the engine and just uh, just head back. But it was a bit disappointing. If, if, if it got, you know, if it managed to get a bit further east, I think I could have contacted, contacted the wave again. Or alternatively, if I'd gone to the south, uh, coming back out of Oban, I could have probably got the same wave bar got going in. Um, so it was a bit of stupidity uh, deciding to stick to the direct track rather than going right. But half, half, half the thing is just you know trying to figure out the best route at the time, and then trying to follow it. And uh, it just didn't work out today. But I think as Sant said before, about one in four flights actually work out as planned. The rest of them, something goes wrong. <laughs> uh, anyway, it was fun. Thanks, Alison. So points to take from that is, is choice of start point. I always, uh, you know, uh, Alice is usually really quite good at selecting tasks and, uh, and so on. I mean, this time it didn't quite work out and the same for me. But I, I always want, because I'm a, a speed merchant, the thing I always want to do is, is, is I always want to start where, where things are good. Uh, and so if that means taking an aero tow, then I'll do so. And so really one wants to go to the really well-defined areas. And, and around Port Mo, um, the thing we have to realize is that in Westerlies, it's not, if there's any south in the wind, uh, Port Moke is not good in, in Westerlies. If it's straight westerly, then you can pick it up at Glen Farg. You can pick it up at Perth. Methlin and uh, and Creef. If once you start going round to the northwest, then you can pick it up definitely at Glenfarg. You can get it off the ridge, but it just depends on how long you got to wait. Whereas again, if I go to Methlin, I know I'm going to go straight into it or Creef. You know, it's not rocket science. Um, now the thing is, is if you take a five thousand foot aero tow. If it's not looking good, you can get back. Again, what we all do, and Alistair does, and we all do as cross-country pilots, is we always have an escape option. Now, I pointed out that there's Oban that we could land in. And if you're in a pure glider, there's no two ways about it that a turbo or uh, you know, self-launcher. We don't use it as a means of uh, of escape. What we use it as is a means of avoiding a field landing. So we always have our escape option. Now, you're going to be braver in a turbo or a self-launcher because we've got our we've got our um, landing option in Oban or some fields around it. But if you're in a pure glider and you're faced with that picture, the chances are you wouldn't try it. And that's the great advantage of a turbo because you always have to get out a jail card, but the chances are, and, and this is where decision-making comes in because particularly when you get into the mountains, because you have to be, you know, you have to sort of say to yourself, you know, is this, is this really safe? And, and, and that came, you know, to me today when I get to talk about my flight. Um, but, you know, always, always have an escape option. All right, so 
and covered Alison's flight. Adrian, are you on? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, just stand by. I'm just, hang on, I've got to get rid of that. So I'm just going to bring up, hang on. Oh, yeah, that's the cloud that Alistair was talking about to the north. Uh, and that's, yeah, we say C Oban. And so this is uh, Adrian's flight. So uh, as you can see, it was attempting to get to Dal Mali. And the way in which he got there is quite interesting, which we'll elaborate later. But uh, Adrian, do you want to have a quick chat about, about, about your flight? Well, I did the same thing as well. I looked at the weather uh, this morning and thought, hmm, it's looking all right now towards west after I spoke to you, sir. But you said you were going to Oban. I thought, well, Oban looks a bit too far because it looks a bit flat over there. So I brought myself back a bit and thought, I'll go to Dalmali uh, and then head towards Edville. And then when I looked at the, the, the forecast later on, it looked like the, the, the sky site forecast said it would, would swing around a little bit more. Uh, and there's a chance of going maybe more northerly than down towards Loch Lomond. So I thought, well, I'll maybe go try and go up to Lagan Bridge and then back again. I wasn't pushing to go a big task. I was just looking to see what I could do. So, you know, that's what I set an air tour over to um, the Dunning area. I got some waves there and I got up to about four and a half, five thousand feet and thought, right, I'm high enough. I'll push forward. But by the time I got to Methvin, I was struggling, I was down to 2,000 feet, and I just, I couldn't get engaged at that height. I just couldn't work out and stuff it. So, you know, I was uh, down on the deep blue sea, so I, I put the turbo on for five minutes and climbed back up to three and a half thousand and engaged. And I must have mucked around there for ages and ages, uh, trying to get properly into the wave. But once I got high enough up, you know, eight, nine thousand feet, I headed off. And as you can see, I headed off towards Dalmari, along the sort of the blue area, along the bar, and then I stopped and I thought, because the cloud was in front of me, I could see the cloud in front, I thought, well, I'm not high enough to get over that. What am I going to do? So I, I said, well, I'm going to push north uh, and try to pick up the next bar over. And as I was pushing north, the Alistair appears below me, about 1,500 feet below me, heading east towards Loch Tay. I hung around there uh, at the northerly part of that northern stroke for a little while trying to climb. Couldn't get very much higher than there, so I thought, I'm just going to go back and try uh, Loch Tay. If I don't get anything there, I'll, I'll head home from there quite easily. And at the east, uh, west end of Loch Tay, I was right into 12, 13 knots up, climbing like an absolute steam train. So I climbed up to just under 17,000 feet and thought, well, I'm into Damali and back again from there. And that's what I did. I went into Damali, a little bit of help from Scottish on the way with uh, deconfliction and things like that which was good of them. And then on the way back, it was very confusing. I had the option of going back to Loch Tay and Clary again, but my track was over towards Edville, and it looked like there could have been bars in that direction, the direction I headed in, but it was just all confused and horrible. And by the time I got to, let me see, where is it? Just about pit, almost Pit Lockley or something, it was just, I was stone cold freezing. I was like, oh, bugger this, I'm going home. And that was my flight. Uh, it was slow, it was very, very slow. Uh, it was difficult as well because the winds were high, you know, 40 odd knots, 50 knots at points. So it was, it was really tricky trying to keep yourself on track. Uh, that was it really. And of course, towards the east, it just looked horrible. So that was one of my other decision points. Whereas at Pink Lockery, it didn't look good ahead. I was cold and I was, I was starting to get to the point where I wasn't going to enjoy it. So I just decided to come home. Okay, thanks, sir. Thanks, Adrian. So what can we take from that? I mean, one of the sort of things, uh, one of the immediate things that comes to mind to me is uh, Adrian got to 17,000 feet. And uh, there's two ways, or there's two basic ways of uh, going cross country. One is wave cross country, and one is just to follow the wave bars and having enough height to jump to the next one. And if you plan it right, and all the rest of it, that's you can achieve high speeds. Other way is to go to hot spots and climb up and then glide to the next hot spot. And there are hot spots around the area. And if we look in terms of in the lee of the escarpment, 
basically Edslaria is usually a very good hotspot and Loch Tay is usually a very good hotspot. And if you carry on up to Crane Lau and across to Loch Lomond Tarbit, that, or Tarb, should I say, that tends to produce an LNG line. So what you can do is if you, if you, there's two ways of flying. One is just flying level, and the other one is climbing high, going to the next hotspot, and then climbing high, and then coming back. So you go from one hotspot to another. It's not the quickest way of doing things, but believe you me, you can, from 19,000 feet, that's uh, over, uh, that's, that's three miles, right? So three miles, that's 120 miles you can glide still air in a discus or a, 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 a pegas or something like that. That's a hell of a distance. Uh, and uh, there are these hot spots. And Loch Tay, particularly at the east end, you've got lots of landable areas in the uh, Tay Valley. These are sort yeah. of things to think about from a cross country point of view. Can I add something, Sam? Going yep. back to previous flights, when I did my 300 uh, goal flight for my gold badge, the one I messed up by going the wrong way, uh, that's exactly what I did. I went into Loch Tay, and the video that I put on Facebook, where you hear me laughing uh, and climbing at 1,000 feet at Loch Tay, that was me getting final glide at Loch Tay all the way to Loch Lomond Tabs and back to Methven from 17,000 feet. That's exactly it. You get high, off you go. Piece of cake. And you just go from one hot spot to another. A crease, another one. You know? And, you know, I mean, today was difficult. You know, there's a lot of cloud. Um, not easy. But there we go. But we build up our experience. Anyway, we'll, we'll have a look at, we'll finish off with my flight. If I can get it going. Uh, so here's mine. And, um, you know, I haven't, uh, had time to put it on the ladder or anything like that because I've just been doing everything this afternoon. And basically, what I did was I took an aero tow to about here, a little bit of wave here, went across the uh, Strathallan zone. I rang them up and there was nobody there because it was eight o'clock in the morning. So, and got to Creef. And it was fine there, you know, plenty of wave. And so I set off and I wasn't happy. So I came back and started again, went off again. And I wasn't happy again and came back because, the, you know, I was there at eight o'clock. And I said to myself, I've got until three o'clock. I've got to be on the ground definitely no later than four. So if it's a reasonable day, I'm not being funny about it, but you should be able to do a cross country at 100 kph. Um, that's sort of pretty average for wave cross countries if, you, if you're reasonably competent. Um, so if you're doing, so, so my wife tells me to stop shouting, but uh, yeah, what was I saying? I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, if, if, to come back to it, um, you set off at nine o'clock. If it's going to be five hours, that means you'll finish at two. If you set off at 10 o'clock, that means you're going to finish at uh, three o'clock. So really, half past 10, 11 o'clock is the last sort of time that you can set off to do a 300. And on my third attempt, it was about half past 10. And so I thought, well, this is it. I'm just going to have to go. And I got to uh, uh, this point here, and it was just too cloudy. And I thought, no, it's not good enough for me. And so basically, I went along, came along Loch Tay to see if that was going to be working or any better, and it wasn't. And I thought I tried to get to uh, Brecon, but it was completely blue. Um, it was blue from about here, a uh, little puff of cloud. And it obviously wasn't working. There was clouds to the south here, and I thought I'd try and work them, and they weren't working. And so I just came back. Um, I never got above, I think, about 10,000 feet. 
but I always have my escape options. I mean, that's the thing I, I, I'll always say. And so I'll finish off with some photos uh, of what of what I took because it was just to give you an idea of what the day looked like. So you see what I mean about it being blue. This is this is me being at Creef, and I'm looking towards the southeast, um, towards uh, uh, the Perth area, and it's now starting to fall. That's at about 10 o'clock. Um, so that's looking to the southwest. Um, that's looking to the north. And obviously we can see what I'm talking about, the phone effect. If we go back, obviously <laughs> that's a phone effect. And so that's looking to the north and that's looking to the west. And basically I made my way onto this wave bar. But it's just, as you can see up here, it's all really too cloudy. And I could see the hole that Alistair was talking about for Obum, but I looked in and I thought, that's just too risky for me. And as happened with Alistair, he had to start the engine. Uh, I thought, it's just not worth it. It's, it's not worth it. So I came back. Um, yeah, that's sort of going along. Um, so I'm heading back east. And this is me trying to get up to Loch Tay. And you can see the wave bars. They're not exactly brilliant or anything like that. Um, and this is just coming along Loch Tay now. And one of the things that's interesting, you know, coming back to that picture of, of uh, uh, Top Meteo showing cloud below 500 feet. Well, there it is. It's below 500 feet over the mountains on the north of Loch Tay. So, you know, that's pretty accurate. And you definitely don't want to be above that, if you see my point. You want to have holes so that you can find an escape route. Um, so anyway, just carrying on. So I went along Loch Tay and there we are. There's another view of Loch Tay. And as you can see, Cloud Bay is practically touching the hills there. And then came, this is a picture actually taken on Wednesday when I came back, uh, which is another story. Uh, and you can see uh, that is definitely the warm sector air. So uh, that's it, about it. That's how long we've been at it. That's exactly an hour. Oh, that's excellent. Okay, any questions? Because the thing I worry about is that it's most probably at too high a level. Because what I want to do, and what all of us want to do, is to promote cross-country. And, and, and what I'm trying to do is, is to point out that actually, if you remain in the lead of the Grampian Escarpment, you can actually do some quite reasonable wave flights. Any comments coming up, Kate, or any questions from anybody? I haven't got anything in the chat. Oh, there's one just appearing. Um, right, somebody's asked, has anyone listed the hotspots that you mentioned, Sant? Uh, well, as far as, as far as, uh, for the Port Moak area, I would say Loch Tay, uh, definitely. Loch Mick, which is, well, I've, I've mentioned them. Lot mix a bit in the mountains, and I wouldn't sort of advise early solo pilots to go. I would say Creef, Methlin, Edsel, Lot Tay. Would you care to add any of them to, to any of them, Alistair? There's another one as well at um, the windmills at Tamalree. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'm already north, northwesterly. Northwesterly. Yeah. Uh, Loch Mick, obviously, further up. Yeah, Loch Mick's a bit. You, you, you've got to be a bit careful to go into Loch Mick, in my opinion. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I've always worked of, on the basic rule that if you're flying in the mountains, you've got to be minimum height you want to be at the mountains is 6,000 feet and at 6,000 feet 
you've either got to be in lift or within gliding range. And when I say within gliding range, within about 15 miles of, uh, of a landing landable area. And if you follow that rule, then, you know, not a lot can go wrong. Uh, and when I say a landable area, I mean a landable area that you can see, that, you know, in a gap. Um, so, yeah, um, Kreef, Amalri, Methlin, Edsel, um, Loch Tay without a shadow of a doubt. And the thing is, is downwind of Loch Tay, because there's basically, depends on the day, there's between five and six bars, wave bars, for you to get to Loch, Mick, uh, to get to Loch Tay that you jump. But basically, you just get a whole series. That's why Port Moke is good in the North Westly, is because it's getting the wave off Loch Tay. And Loch Tay is the primary one. So, seven, some, Alistair has put up for a North Westerly Dunning, Methven, Creef, Loch Tay, Amal Ree. Was that your list as well, or was there anything? Yeah, else? pretty much. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Just making a note of that. Um, and somebody else has asked, what's the usual lowest height to pick up wave? Now, Alistair has answered 1100, but I think that's exceptional, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it is exceptional. I, I've picked up wave. Well, when you call wave, um, it, there's rotor and you can, you, you can rotor saw. I, I'd say 1500 feet is, 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 it, you, you, you can pick it up. I mean, I, I would say, I mean, sometimes the wave actually, you know, you, you can you can take a winch launch from Port Mo and go straight into the wave. Um, you know, it just depends where wh whether you're in phase with, with 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 the wave. I mean, coming back to the diagram, right? This boundary layer, this shear line when it's waving it, there's obviously a high point and there's obviously a low point and what you've got to do is transition from the low the low point can be surprisingly low it can be surprisingly low and for that to turn around and say it's unusual i i think it depends on the, on 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 the day um I, I really do but i wouldn't say i would say Basically, to ensure, to, to, to know when you're truly established in the wave is when you're uh, 500 feet above cloud base. But the cloud base can be 1,000 feet or 1,500 feet, if you see my point. Um, it just depends on, on, if you've got a lovely air mass, then um, it, it can be surprising. Uh, I, I would say... Yeah, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. I'd say it's. I'm just trying to think of the possibilities of, you know, as a percentage wise. Um, I'd say what 10, 15 percent possibility of that happening. Typically, you can get in to wave from about three thousand, two and a half, three thousand feet. Yeah. Once it starts going smooth, and you get nice lift. But you know, today I got in once from. What, 2,000 feet and once from 1,200 feet. Okay, it was a bit broken to start with, but it was climbable. Uh, which, but that's pretty unusual to be able to get in quite that low. Well, on Wednesday, on Wednesday, uh, you know, when I forgot to switch my oxygen, I literally just went on the ridge and I just climbed onto the ridge and just moved out. I could see the cloud and I just moved out onto, uh, you know, what's it, East, east of Balgedi. I moved out to east of Algedi and, um, uh, and you know, just transitioned. I would say it's about 2,000 feet. It's, you know, there's no cobblestones effect or anything like that. It was just straight into it. And I was away. And I thought, oh, shit, that's what the option on. And I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't reach out. I couldn't reach around and switch it on. All, all the muscles in my arm trying to switch the oxygen. I had to come down and land. <laughs> there we go. So there's a couple more questions on the chat. Um, yeah. Somebody's asked 
if you could comment on airspace implications, um, airways and flying above flight level 100. Well, uh, to take today, for example, um, we opened up the Bathurst 600 um, weekend area. Uh, and so basically sectors Alpha and Bravo were clear. I did ask Scottish for a crossing clearance of Papa 600. I mean, really, um, again, if you go to the BGA webinar, uh, I did a whole series on, on, on wave soaring and I covered the, the first bit was just an overview. The second bit was uh, met. The third bit was air, airspace. And the fourth bit was planning a task. And, um, but essentially, you have to read up about it. And, um, you know, airspace infringements, November 560 is one thing, because that's class E airspace. Um, but there is the information there. And, you know, there are, there is, there is on the BGA website, my talk on, I think it is part three of wave soaring in Scotland. Uh, that, that covers airspace. Um, I really, to cross Class A airspace, PAPA 600, I think one has to be, have a degree of proficiency because we are, uh, because we are operating in a, uh, in Class A airspace, uh, I don't think that one can just bumble along and, uh, and not go and not, and ask for a clearance to cross it, I think one has to read up about it. Um, you know, the specific, <laughs> oops, the specific question was about flight level 100. And today, oh, if I, the, NOTAM, well, the NOTAM, you had the NOTAM active. So oh, yeah. all gliders were allowed above flight level 100. Yeah. yeah. With the NOTAM being active. And yeah. the PAPA 600 delegation, which you activated this morning, mm. is covered in the letter of agreement, which is on the club website. Yeah. Uh, and you need to have read that letter of agreement before making use of it. Uh, but basically, the whole area was delegated to us. So provided you've read the letter of agreement and uh, uh, understand what you're getting into, then it means that the Scottish TMA and Papa 600 up to Perth was available to us. There without, has to be... Without talking to Scottish. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just, just that... So it is actually, it's not that hard, is it? I no. mean, you know, even, even folk like me can do it. <laughs> um, if, if PAPA 600 has been opened, as Alice said, you need to understand what area that covers and make sure you've got a moving map that will tell you. But if it is open, then you can go through it and you don't have to talk to anybody. It's a good idea to listen, but you don't have to talk to anybody. And if Sant has helpfully put in a NOTAM about flight level 100, you can go above flight level 100 and you don't need to talk to anybody. It's a good idea to listen, talk to them if you can, but you don't have to. Is, it, is, it, is that fair enough, Sam? Yeah. The only thing with flight level 100, no time, is if you're going to cross November 560, which is uh, at the uh, western end of Loch Tay, then, then you have to talk to air traffic. Um, to get a cro crossing clearance. Well, well, actually, 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 you don't if you've got a transponder. Yeah, exactly. If you've got a transponder, you don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hairs, but yeah, yeah. but that's, yeah. that's normal. Yeah. You, if you yeah. don't have a transponder, you have to talk to no, them. That's right. So yeah. somebody has asked about whether you, you had to sign a book for the letter of agreement. Um, there, again, have a look at the, at the site manual on the website because there are two letters of agreement and the one we've been talking about is the Papa 600 delegation. It was this very straightforward one that just, if we ask for, at weekends, we can only do it at weekends, but if we ask for that area to be opened, then it's open, basically. I mean, you know, it's that simple. There is another letter of agreement that isn't limited to weekends. Yeah, <laughs> somebody has just posted the link. Thank you. Yeah, have a look at that. Uh, look at letters of agreement but the one that you're wondering about where you had to sign a book you don't actually have to sign a book but you do have to be able to guarantee that you've read the details of 
the the one that divides the Papa 600 into different areas, A2, whatever it is, I can't remember. And you can ask for crossings of particular specific corridors and you have to ask and you have to know what you're doing. And that is a more complicated one that you do need to be semi-expert to use. But that's separate from the weekend delegation one. That's probably as clear as mud. Can, can somebody make that any clearer than I have? Yeah, basically, uh, the weekend area, as long as you know what the boundaries of it are, you can do what you like, up to flight level 190. Uh, all you've got to know is, is, is how big the area is. And, and uh, you know, you should have that on your moving map. Um, but, I mean, you know, I'm not being funny or anything like that. You have, you know, for all this sort of stuff, I mean, to be a competent glider pilot, um, you know, you, you've got to read and you've got to learn and, you know, all the rest of it, right? It yeah. just doesn't sort of, you know, it's practice, practice, practice. There's a few more questions. Um, yeah. I'm sort of, I don't want to miss some, so I'm going back a little bit. Somebody asked, <laughs> it's a very interesting question, is anyone at the club trying to do these tasks without a motor? Uh, yes, I mean, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, Alex Maitland um, flew today and um, and he did really quite well. I mean, he got up to Blair Gary and all this sort of stuff. Yes, there are. Um, you know, Alex, you know, I really admire Alex. He's just got this sort of, uh, you know, Vega and, um, you know, um, and Alex does a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, uh, there's, there's, um, Tony Sperling as well. Yeah, Tony Sperling. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's, uh, Kevin Dillon, uh, who, I mean, I know he's got a lap now, but I mean, he used to do a hell of a lot in the DG 100. I mean, you know, all that a turbo does is, is, <laughs> if I hadn't taken an aero tow, I'd have motored to proof. Uh, you know, that's all you got. It's, 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 I, I don't use the turbo. It's, it's like, for example, um, you know, um, like, for example, going today at, uh, to go to try to get to Ober. I didn't want to put myself in a situation where I have to use my engine. Um, I, I just don't want to do it um, because I don't want to land in a field if you see my point. Um, an engine is not everything. It's, it's, it, they can be notoriously unreliable uh, and I've landed out quite a few times due to its unreliability or being too low to start it. And, um, and I'd rather not land out these days. Uh, and so, you know, as I say, Alex, uh, th there are people that you, obviously you you can your boundaries are, are slightly improved because the possibility of a land out is reduced by having a turbo. But the decision making, I don't think, changes that significantly. Have, have I put that correctly, Alistair? I mean, you know, I mean, would you care to comment on that? Yeah, I think, I think with the turbo, you tend to push on a bit more, but at the end of the day, you need your escape routes, you need your landing options, exactly the same as you do with a pure glider. The only difference is that you tend to start the engine over a field rather than landing it. Yeah. But you're trying to avoid using it. But it does, yeah. there's no doubt, but it does make life a bit easier for getting into wave in the first place. But you see, I hate the engine for thermal soaring because you know, basically, if you're going to use the engine thermally, you, you've, you've got to have started the process above a thousand feet. Whereas within the circuit, you can thermal away as long as, you know, you're in the right position and so on. You can thermal away. And I mean, maybe I'm being indiscreet by saying it. But you can firm the way from five, six hundred feet. And I hate using a flying with a turbo. I wish I didn't have one where I'm firming because 
I have to decide earlier to start the engine. For wave soaring, to me, it's it's quite easy because you you, <laughs> you usually start it reasonably high. Um, you know, but I hate it. I absolutely loathe a turbo with a passion for thermal soaring because as sure as eggs is eggs, when I've started the bloody turbo at a thousand feet, <laughs> a minute I've gone through a thermal. I hate it. And there have been times when I've said, stuff it. I'm just going to land if I don't get away, if you see my point. And I've done that. Um, I hate them for thermal soaring. I agree with you, Sam. Every time you put the engine on, there's always a thermal just right after. <laughs> Every time. Say again? Every th thermal, especially when I was down south, whenever you put the engine on, there's always a good thermal just beyond where you've decided to start yeah. it. And at the Nationals, there was a couple of flights to get back. I've scraped away from 650 feet to get back to the airfield. And I was already thinking engine, already thinking fuel. I thought, no, I'm going to scrape away from this because I'm not going to land 8K short again. Yeah. Like I did at Hus Yeah. Um, now, there was, there, there's a couple of questions. I was going to go to Alec first. I think, Alec, you had a comment? Um, yes. Um, there's been quite a bit of comment about hotspots and recommendations about where they might be found. I just wanted to offer the observation that some years ago, um, I was flying P2 with John Williams in the mountain soaring competition. Um, on an assigned area task. We were doing really quite well, but we fell out of the wave round about Pitlochry. Anyway, John decided he would dive under a cloud, head for Loch Tay, where it always works. There was then a very long pause, <laughs> and he said, well, it usually works. And then we spent, oh, it must have been almost an hour, uh, ridge soaring a tiny patch of sunlight on the shoulder of a hill until we were able to get back out of the valley and eventually back into the wave. Um, hot spots are good when they work, but they don't always work. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's not, I mean, that's what this is all part of the art of gliding and soaring. I mean, you know, what you're doing is it's all risk management. It's all risk management. What is the probability of something happening? I mean, today. I mean, Adrian got up to 17,000 feet at Loch Tay. I went along Loch Tay and I hardly got anything. Mm. You know, uh, it, uh, wind, wind direction really has a, an effect on it. I mean, Loch Tay, uh, it's surprising how often Loch Tay doesn't work. Mm. But I mean, you know, you, you just have to assess the sky and as to whether it's working. But I mean, they're generalizations. They're not, it's not like, you know, 100% or anything like that, you know. You, ha you build up this core of knowledge and experience, right? And and when we talk about these hotspots, they are generalizations. Mm -hmm. um, I think I should have also added, we did have a field pick. Yes. Good. I don't know where at Loch Tay, but still. <laughs> John, I'll <laughs> get I, into it. <laughs> can I add some of the nature of hotspots? What I do is once I try to get some height, I try to look out as far as I can to see what the clouds are looking like. See if I can see anything that's given me a, a, an indication of more lift in that area. Like, for example, at Loch Tay, like, for example, up towards Cairnwell or, or Loch Tay, just to see if there's any indication that they're working better than where I am. Sant, um, there's a, a different question on the, um, on the chat uh, asking, could you please elaborate on the transition from ridge to wave for a beginner? Let me, uh, let me um, uh, I wonder if I can draw on this. Uh, I can do. Let me, uh, let me go to, let's just get a blank thing on this. Hang on a tip. Right, now then.
Right, so here we've got Port Moat Ridge and we've got the wave and it's coming down and here it's out of phase. So you're in your little glider and you're floating up and down the ridge and you're suddenly wondering why you're just a couple of hundred feet above the ridge. And it's because uh, the ray wave is out of phase. And wave, I'm not going to go into the technicalities of what wave does because it moves up and down. Uh, as you know, as the day, as, as a wave bar, you know, exists, there's different type of wave bars and the rest of it. It goes on and on and on. It is a matter of, of reading up about it. So here we have an example of, let me see if I can get down a book here. Can I erase? Is that erase? Whoops, sorry, no, let's just, uh, right, let's just do another one. So there's the wave out of phase. So let's just do another one. So what we then want, is it doing that? And you're flying your glider, right and i i have spent hours on the ridge and there are days when you sit there uh, it's like for example today on the north on the north uh, on bernati bernati was producing i was sitting there thinking i was at bernati and i was flying along at 2300 feet in the in, in the, on the ridge and that was definitely wave affected ridge all right, because normally you only float around about 1600 feet. I know the wind was quite strong, but they, it was wave affected ridge. And, um, and I could see people going up to, I could see them up at four or 5,000 feet and they're in the wave. So what happens is, is you're on the ridge and you've got the transition point, you know, this boundary layer. And what's happening is, is, what the air is doing is is like that and what you do is you transition forward you circle or you s turn and you keep and you get blown back so what you do is you move forward again and you circle again and and eventually as you get higher your transition into the wave. It, it depends how you do it. The thing is, is, is not to treat it as a thermal. What you do is if there's a gust, you pull back on the stick. I really abuse the aircraft. Um, luckily, because I'm such a fat so-and-so, my CG is quite forward. So uh, it, I have not been able to spin my discus uh, because I'm so overweight. And uh, as a result of that, I, I really abuse it um, because it's, it, it's highly unlikely I'm ever going to spin it. Um, and, you know, what you do is, is sometimes, as I say, on Wednesday, what happened was it was nice and smooth and I just transitioned straight into the wave. And, and it, it, the wave bars move along. They sometimes move forward as well. And it's just a matter of the wave getting in phase with the ridge. And basically what you do is you maintain position and, if anything, move forward. Um, and that those again are general generalizations because sometimes it can be behind the ridge or it can be across the ridge if you see my point. But what you you know if you see the cloud, what you do is you stay in your position. So rather than firmly, what you have to do is always head into wind. And you find that gradually getting higher and higher and higher. Sometimes it's dead smooth, other times it's turbulent. If it's turbulent, you definitely know you're on the transition point, and what you've got to do is move forward. Is that an adequate explanation? Can, can I just add a, a point as someone who is definitely not an expert, that an awful lot I find is perseverance. Absolutely. Because um, I don't know how many times it's actually been a good day and I've gone back and landed and not got into the wave. And it's, I've realised it's just because I didn't try hard enough. And sometimes when I think I'm just going to stay here until I get into this ruddy wave because I know it's there and it can take over an hour sometimes and you're just 
trying to find it and as Sam says you find a little bit and you just pull back in that and you if you find a bit you you s turn or you circle or you and you just keep persevering basically <laughs> yeah what what happens is is that the, the ridge will go up and down and so you'll notice that the highest that you can stay at is say 1600 feet and then you'll find that it lowers to 1200 feet that's obviously we're getting out of phase and then it'll go up to 1800 feet and you'll see it does this cycling and and you know when i had a pure glider when i had the label and the dg i always used to work on the uh i always used to work on the uh assumption that what you do is you do it until you're bored and then you give it another hour <laughs> And um, on average, I would say it takes two hours to get into the wave off the roof. You can be lucky. As I said, Wednesday, I was straight in it. Second time, I motored into it. But if I hadn't have been impatient, I'd have got into it within half an hour, I reckon, because I could see it. But I just couldn't be asked. Uh, and the other good tip is, if, if you can afford it, find a good tug pilot who knows about wave. Uh, we had Tony Brown today and he knows all about wave and just ask him to tow you into the wave please. Yep absolutely and me what I do is I tell the tug pilots where I want to go because but, I fly with tug pilots that but if you don't know then if you've got a good wave pilot in the tug they will take you there. <laughs> yeah yeah okay well, I think we're it's an hour and a half one last question. Anything at all? All right. Okay. Well, this will be on video and we'll put it on the uh, club website. Um, and uh, I hope it's been useful. Um, our next talk is, uh, is uh, David Coates. I think it's December the 4th. And um, one of the things that I, I really feel is, is that you know as I indicated in the um, you know in the Port Moak instance is that we're a broad church now me I'm an obsessive cross-country pilot and but there are other aspects to gliding uh, many many other aspects uh, a lot of people do it because of the social side of it um, and I can remember when I was younger you know that was really a big part of it uh you know particularly going on competitions and things like that it wasn't about the flying it's about the piss ups and um and it is a broad church uh, and davy likes messing about with airplanes and and thank god for that you know um pete sharp house loves aerobatics um a lot of people love instructing and a lot of people i mean i don't know if some of you remember dave clemson but dave he, he was never happier uh, than when he was in a tractor digging holes or destroying trees and things like that and uh yeah the point is 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 that it's not just about flying it's it's there's a whole gamut of activities that that you know people find fulfilling and and I know I go on about cross country, but there are lots of other things to do within gliding. And, and I really want to put across, or I want, you know, with this winter series of talks, is, is to actually go on about the other things that we can do. You know, like we could have, hopefully post COVID, you know, dinners and all this sort of stuff. You know, it's a whole gamut of things. Uh, and so, as I say, Davy will be talking about, um, you know, working on particularly wooden gliders, and, and uh, you know, which are obviously interesting. Uh, you know, we've got historic uh, uh, gliders at, uh, at Port Moat. So uh, I think that'll be an interesting chat. So I think we'll finish there. And, uh, you know, thanks for everybody being, you know, coming along and, and all the rest of it. And uh, lots of good questions. Can I add just a quick thought for the beginners? Not to be scared to come and ask questions of us other pilots, you know, of what we're doing, why we're doing, and what we're thinking, because that may be the only way that some of these people will learn. Yeah. And sometimes, if you're lucky enough to catch one of us in a good enough mood in a two-seater, there may be a back seat. You never know. 
Yeah. You know, we, we all started the same as uh, Andrew Powers. We were all there one day. Yeah. Oh, well, I was, I was quite so. recent at it, and what I did was I always rock up and ask them, what are you doing today? Where are you going? Why are you going? You know, what do you think? What do you think I could do? And just carried on from there, and then did the yeah. same with Phil, did the same with our stuff, and just gleaned information from there and, and learned stuff, and just asked questions. So don't be scared to come and ask. That's it. Good. Right, we'll finish there. Thanks, everybody. Okay. And good uh, thank you. Good night. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ed. Cheers. Thanks. Bye.